Um, we're going to get underway. Can everyone at the back hear me? As that will be a good indicator of whether you can hear, um, hear it and Marie as well. Excellent. Okay, so it, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Hera Cook and Marie Russell, Dr. Hera Cook, Dr. Marie Russell, um, from the University of Otago, Wellington. Uh, Hera is a public health historian and um, Marie a public health researcher. They've both been looking at firearms um, since around 2016. Uh, the, the work that they've done has included interviewing people who are involved with firearms, including firearms users, and also looking at a range of printed material. Um, and they have a, a wide range of other research interests, but I will stick to the firearms for today. Um, before they get started, just I'm, I'm aware that this can be a contentious issue in some areas. Can we please save any questions until the end of the presentation? Uh, and then there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so, and the, the, the framework for that we'll get to um, when that happens. So, who's starting? Hera, excellent. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody along to this talk. I'd particularly like to welcome those um, who may come from um, groups that don't normally come along to our public health seminars. And um, I gave a talk on Tuesday to the Tarara Tramping Club and we had some hunters turned up and that really may enabled us to have a very um, interesting discussion afterwards. So we really appreciate your presence online and in the room, um, as well as our Department of Public Health members. Um, okay, um, what I'm gonna start, do, start with is um, getting this to work. Not, not working. Oh, oh sorry. Okay, so I'm going to start with some definitions from the Arms Act 1983. So firearms are anything from which any kind of shot can be discharged by force of explosive. Air guns are any weapon which uses gas or compressed air to discharge a shot. Now, there's terms used in the Arms Act which are not defined in the schedule, and one of them is gun. Now, gun is used for weapons, not defined above, and they use it where convenient, like gun show or gun cotton. It's a much older word, and it's used broadly in everyday language, and I will probably use it quite often. Um, the word weapon in the 1983 Arms Act appears to use any item not otherwise defined that can be used to discharge a projectile. Um, again, that's a much older word. Now, what we find is that the word firearms and guns tend to be used interchangeably in international research. So these New Zealand definitions, sometimes it's quite hard to stick to them when we are also referring to international research. Okay, so Christchurch, New Zealand, 15th of March, 2019. 51 people were killed. What has been achieved since this massacre? So, okay, on the 21st of March, there was a ban on all military-style semi-automatics of the kind used by the killer. On the 1st of April, the Arms Amendment Bill was introduced, and then there was a one-day hearing on the bill in the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee. 12th of April, the Arms Prohibited Firearms Magazines and Parts Amendment Act 2019 passed into law. That's nearly as fast as the process that took place in Australia, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, and it's also been announced around the 20th of June that the gun buyback in which all the arms that are now prohibited in their parts will be bought back by the government from those who have previously owned them legally. And that will take six months. Now, during that six month period, the government would also like to pass a second tranche of gun law reforms. And we'll describe what we know about that at the end of this talk. Okay, I'm just gonna do a brief comparison of the Australian law that was passed after the Port Arthur massacre in Tasmania on the 28th to 29th of April, 1996. There were 35 people killed and 23 wounded. Now, 
many of those people who were wounded on, in that massacre are still suffering severely. And that gives us some idea of what might be the long-term out long outcomes for those who survived the Christchurch massacre and just how deadly these weapons can be. Okay, so in Australia, um, they agreed broad prohibitions on semi-automatics of all types. In New Zealand, we've only banned a limited range of semi-automatic firearms. In Australia, there were very limited exemptions and they had to be justified at length. Now, in New Zealand, in the New Zealand legislation, there are a lot of exemptions. Licensed dealers, dock employees and other people engaged in pest control, bona fide firearms collectors, bona fide museum directors and curators, bona fide theatre and film, television production companies. Now, we're not altogether convinced that we need that many exemptions. Okay, in Australia, there are limits on the number of firearms for those who do obtain exemptions. In New Zealand, there's no limits on the number of firearms that an individual licensed firearms owner can possess. In Australia, licensed firearm owners are permitted ammunition only for firearms for which they are licensed. In New Zealand, there are no limits and no records of purchase of ammunition. Now, we recognise it will be inconvenient if limits are placed on ammunition, but not grossly so. Okay, so in Australia, children 10 years or under are not permitted to use firearms. In New Zealand, children of any age can use firearms if supervised by a licensed firearms owner. Okay, <clears throat> guns in New Zealand. Now, we've been asked quite often online and in person why we think, and the firearms users community has complained a great deal about the banning of firearms, which they see as unreasonable. We think that guns need to be limited because they have a lethal capacity to cause harm. They are portable, available, and relatively cheap. There is no other comparatively lethal means of causing death to others, that, except for things like suicide bombs, which really um, have a far more limited um, potential for use. Okay, so New Zealand has the 17th highest number of firearms per civilian globally. Gun research has been limited by National Rifle Association of USA inspired restrictions in the USA. However, the existing research suggests that increase in the prevalence of guns is associated with increase in the prevalence of violent crime. The availability of our firearms is strongly associated with increased suicide. And there's a lot of other associations which there hasn't been sufficient research for us to really establish them strongly, but there are, for example, clear indications that um, where guns are available, they, they play a role in family violence. Okay, in New Zealand, there were 867 deaths from 2000 to 2015. That was an average of 54 per year. And I think we should say that number has been declining. Um, the suicides average 40 per year and the homicides average seven per year. The rest of them are things like hunting accidents. Um, there's also injuries averaging 120 per year. Okay, so why do we want change in our gun culture? Um, we think there's potential for further terrorism. We started this research, and particularly me, um, coming back from having lived overseas and having been in cities where there were a, a number of terrorist attacks. It seemed very clear that there were no safeguards in New Zealand about, against such events here. Um, we have a very high rate of family violence. Um, Lead exposure is a problem that the gun users community has not been very interested in. Our research suggested that in violent criminal cultures, guns like the military style semi-automatics are used for display and in honor conflicts as much as in crime against those outside those criminal communities. Um, in burglaries, guns are small, valuable items that encourage theft. 
And the gun, community, gun user community talks about this a great deal. Okay, we'd also think we should be trying to undermine violent ideologies which are expanding and now including white supremacy. It has to be said, we didn't come across white supremacy in the course of our research. We certainly came across common and garden ordinary racism, um, but not developed ideologies. Okay, so, but beliefs current in New Zealand, when we think about the beliefs around guns current today in New Zealand, in our research, we found incorrect beliefs about a right to self-defense and a right to own guns, neither of which exist within New Zealand law. Okay, Paul Clark last week, the former chair of the Council of Licensed Firearm Owners and owner of New Zealand Ammunition, which supplies the police and the military in New Zealand, said on Radio New Zealand, if gun owners could not access the courts, the only alternative is revolution. When asked by the host, Lisa Owen, what he meant by revolution, Clark said, literally, what I just said, what have you got to lose? What other alternatives have you got in life? When Owen asked if he was talking about a physical violent uprising, Clark said it was likely. Yes, it could happen. People are aggrieved. You've been screwed by a government for a crime you didn't commit. How do you think that makes you feel? Clark has now apologized. The Council of Licensed Firearm Owners has been warning their members for some time to be careful what they say on social media or in public. But we would ask what are they encouraged, being encouraged to feel and say in private? And I've got some examples from the Kiwi Gun Blog Facebook page here. Okay, a violent revolution, while horrendous to consider, the fact is things are building towards a moral <laughs> case for one. Um, he is indeed right that a lot of people are angry about the way the police and government are treating law-abiding citizens, and if they aren't careful, they must, may spark off more than they can handle. We don't think, particularly young men who may be vulnerable, who may be living in rural areas and not having a lot of association with other people to talk face-to-face -face about these issues, should be being encouraged to think and feel in these terms. But what I'd like to do now is to go on and just describe the license, what we know about licensed firearm owners today and then talk about traditional gun culture and just have a few suggestions as to why some, where some of this feeling might be coming from. Okay, so there's just under 250,000 licensed firearm owners in New Zealand today. 93% are male, many are aged over 50. It's an aging population. There's little information as to what the majority of licensed firearm owners, especially rural men, feel about gun issues. There's no surveys and meetings by, for example, the national MP Chris Bishop have largely gone through the gun club. So he did ask federated farmers, we think, as well. Um, research is needed on this. Um, because the firearms, licensed firearms uh, owners are an aging population, there's been a strong push to encourage women and children to take up shooting from gun manufacturers, retailers, gun clubs, and individuals who together make up our gun lobby, as well as from ordinary um, firearms users. Um, but this, the gun lobby claims to speak for all gun users, but membership of all organized clubs and groups is only around 20 to 30,000 people, around 10% of licensed firearms owners. Many of those in leadership positions have in the past openly admired the National Rifle Association of America. Over the last six months, that has been, really been revealed to be a deeply financially corrupt organization, which appears to be falling apart as a consequence. Um, the po their policies have resulted in very high gun deaths. 40,000 people died from guns in the USA in 2017. And a vigilante culture of self-defense, which of course contributes to those gun deaths, but it also contributes to a community in which there is a lack of trust and which by definition cannot be a safe and peaceful society in which to live. Okay, comparison of what I've just described with traditional New Zealand gun culture. Now, when people talk about this, they're generally talking about the period from the 1940s to the 70s, which some historians have called the golden weather for New Zealand. 
It was a largely rural society. Most of the so-called urban population lived in very small towns. Hunting and farming were part of possibly most people's everyday life, but certainly many people's everyday life. Rural and small town boys learned to use a gun when they were around eight to 12 years old, in very many cases. It was a much smaller population. There was little awareness of conservation issues and almost no tourists. That meant that going into the bush was a much more relaxed environment, much um, wilder and less um, outside influences. People who didn't use guns were relaxed generally about having guns around. Guns were seen as a necessary tool for farmers and colours. Attempts at restricting hunting, traditional in the UK, such as game seasons, licenses and bag limits had been dropped in the 1930s. So for hunters, the introduction of cars had also made getting to the bush and getting meat home practical. Refrigerators made keeping meat possible. There was very little regulation of butchering and selling meat, and a deer carcass could be sold for about a week's wages in the 1970s. And what I, ha what I haven't said is when I talk about a week's wages, we're also talking about a society in which there was full employment, in which housing, thanks to government action over the previous decades, was much cheaper um, and of better quality than it had been 30 or 40 years previous to that, and certainly much cheaper than it is now. Um, it was a society in which people were better off in terms of their quality of life. Okay, now what I'm going to do now, and what I'd like to, sorry, finish up by saying in relation to that is, I think when we look at the tension among the firearms users, the losses that they're responding to may be a lot wider than just those to do with guns. And we need to think about this in relation to our society as a whole. Um, now I'd like to hand over to Marie to talk about some specific public health issues. Kia ora Yes, I have a public health case study to talk about to you. Uh, in recent decades, we've, we've seen the public health issues arising from deregulation and its consequences in a low tax economy. And perhaps to a public health audience, um, the issue of leaky homes is a familiar example there. In the firearms area, there appears to have been, been underfunding of the, um, of the police uh, administration of firearms. And taxpayers, we found, have been actually covering the gap there, paying more than half, sometimes a lot more than half, of the costs of firearms licensing and administration. So in an era when user pays was the catchword, in fact, it didn't really apply to firearms owners. At the same time, there appears to have been little or inadequate regulation of a particular health and environmental of a particular health and environmental hazard and an undesirable response to it from the firearms community, and Hill has already mentioned this. I'm talking about lead exposure and the response to it. So our colleague, our colleague, Dr. Hera, uh, sorry, Dr. Deborah Reed from Massey University in the Environmental Health Indicators Unit there has been helping with this. Um, she's pointed out that lead exposure among firearms users is um, under-assessed and under-reported. Blood lead levels over 0.48 micromoles per litre is a notifiable condition. So we do have data. The numbers are small, but the data show that the two largest groups affected are house painters, first of all, house renovators dealing with lead paint, and then second, the second largest group, not far behind, is recreational shooters, and almost all of them from indoor firing ranges. There are two pathways in lead exposure from firearms. Um, although uh, th the first one through lead-based ammunition, and there is also lead in the primer that sets off the explosion in the barrel when you, when you fire a gun, fire a firearm. Um, so lead dust, fumes, and small particles um, can be inhaled or ingested. And even someone handling your um, 
clothes that you wore at the, at the range from undoing the laundry could be affected. People clearing out the bullet stops at ranges need special um, training and, and really heavy duty uh, protective clothing. And there's increasing evidence from research about ingestion of small lead particles, often microscopical, microscopic particles from meat that's been shot. And the average number of particles found in, in a deer carcass being 366 particles, I believe. A number of them microscopic, you can't see them. You don't know you're ingesting it. The only New Zealand study that I've seen testing shooters was by Peter George and his colleagues in 1993. They tested small bore rifle shooters um, before and after their busy shooting season and there were concerning results. Um, other animals than humans can be affected too. There were 100 cows on a firing range down south somewhere who died a few years ago from ingesting lead and sheep have also been affected from browsing on contaminated land. The Fish and Game Council, I want to talk about ducks. The Fish and Game Council of New Zealand um, issues licenses for duck hunters. Um, and they have in recent years banned the use of lead projectiles over waterways. And there will be a complete ban on lead shot for waterfowl from 2020. What was happening is the ducks, when they're dabbling along and going down up tails all, were ingesting pieces of lead which they mistook for grit, which, as you know, birds need for their digestion. During our research project, um, where we interviewed 33 people, about half of whom were leaders in the firearms community, we were struck by the, um, those people's lack of concern and, in some cases, their dismissal of and even hostility to concerns about lead. Some said that... Um, Ventilation at indoor firing ranges, if it was uh, done properly, it, it, you know, problems. And along with um, very careful hand washing after you've been shooting. But some of them referred to us, uh, referred us to this person, Dr. Neil Hayes of Carterton, whose long article about lead is available online. He claims that the anti-lead shot discourse this is just some excerpts from his article. He claims that the anti-lead shot discourse is a conspiracy by Fish and Game, the Department of Conservation, Forest and Bird, some regional councils and others, and the United Nations, that there's a conspiracy to restrict firearms. But this is not true. Um, <laughs> I have to say. That he said the same groups are also lying about 1080, global warming and bovine TB. So that's been concerning. There's been quite a lot of media coverage at different times over the years about lead and firearms issues. And some of the sporting disciplines have picked up on this. I've been looking at some of the range manuals um, from the different sh uh, shooting groups. Here's Pistol New Zealand, for example. Most of the range manuals are interested in a uh, instruction about angles and trajectories and preventing ricochets that might get somebody shot, which is great. But some of them don't mention lead at all. And when I looked at Pistol New Zealand's manual a couple of years ago, it didn't seem to have anything. Now it does. Good on you, Pistol New Zealand. Um, the small ball rifle shooters, the ones who were tested, as I mentioned in 1993, have been quite good about making sure that they've got plenty about lead in their range manual. But it's concerning that the others don't, and that includes the police range manual, where they mention the word lead only in passing. And um, the clay target shooting manual doesn't mention the word lead at all. We are also concerned about the police brochure. Yeah, beginning with air guns. Um, so air guns don't use primer, so there's no lead there, but they they often use lead um, pellets. And I remember as a child when I was learning to shoot with my first slug gun, that um, instead of carrying the pellets in my pocket and breaking open the gun and putting the um, projectile in and then shooting, I did what a lot of children in our country have done. I think I put a bunch of pellets in my mouth. These are lead pellets. And just got them out one by one to fire. Do not try this at home. <laughs> I sometimes think how tall I might have been <laughs> if I hadn't been doing that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, we would like the police, please take this section that they've got there where they say that you could set up a, 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 a range in your backyard or basement. We do advise against setting up any kind of range in your basement because of the enclosed space and what can happen with lead there. So I was wondering who is in charge of firing ranges. Um, it's not all that clear. What I did was I sent out an official information request recently to all councils and territorial authorities asking about how many kinds of ranges they had of different types in their areas, what measures they have in place for assessing lead exposure to humans and lead contamination of the environment, of the soil and potentially runoff into waterways. Now, the results have been intriguing. I'm still waiting on a few results, so I don't have um, final numbers there. I think this number of 248 ranges is a gross underestimate, and um, I have a number of reasons for saying that. Many of the councils responded that it's not their responsibility to keep a register of firing ranges, and that they don't know how many ranges they've got. If there's a resource consent for a range, they might have some information about it, or if someone's made a complaint, they might have some information. Lots of the ranges that it exists have been around for many decades and some for well over 100 years. That's a lot of lead. Um, a lot of them predate the Resource Management Act. So the resource consents that I have looked at um, in terms of concerns about human health talk about noise. And you will see pictures of people at firing ranges or if you've been to a range, you'll see people wear earmuffs. Um, but they're not necessarily protecting themselves at all. They may, may not even know about the lead danger. Um, I was intrigued that some of the regional councils um, suggested I contact the local councils. Local contact councils suggest that I contact the regional councils. And you can guess the rest. Some of them told me to contact the police and the regional public health. Um, Pistol New Zealand's website lists, I think, about 92 or 97 pistol ranges around the country. And a number of councils mentioned ranges they knew about which were on private land, and anyone can set up a firing range on private land and invite their friends over with no regulation at all or um, assessment. So in, um, some of them knew about military and police ranges in their areas. In general, it seems that the firing ranges are pretty much a law unto themselves. They're regulated, inspected, and assessed by the different national shooting organizations, and there may, may be occasional checks by police. I think we need some more research in this area. And when we held a summer school here a uh, year, year and a half ago, um, we had an offer at that time from a local fire, a firearms hub to be involved in testing, but we don't have any funding to do it ourselves. But it would be great if um, other people would take up this challenge and start doing another test. The last one was 25 years ago. It's time we had some more. I'll hand you back to Hera. Okay, there's other issues. Um, these include um, the open arming of frontline police. Many firearms users also feel that they don't want the open arming of frontline police. Um, the research suggests it does not make the public safer and it does not make the um, frontline police safer. So. That's something that we're quite strongly imposed to. We don't think it will contribute to a safer and more peaceful New Zealand. Um, we think there should be age limits on children using guns. We don't think preschool and primary school aged kids should be using guns. Um, there's toy guns. Now, toy guns are actually manufacturers, licensed by manufacturers to, sorry, start that sentence again. <laughs> Manufacturers license replicas of real guns. In the United States, over 300 people have been killed by the police when they've been holding these replica guns because it is not possible to distinguish them from the real gun until you are very close to them, and I'm talking a couple of feet. Um, foreign hunters. Um, we've got very little oversight of foreign hunters. They come and they present whatever license they have from their home country. They pay a $25 visit a firearms license, and that's it. Um, we think maybe there could be more overview of this system. 
in many other countries in the world, um, there are limits on hunting. We have completely free hunting. I mean, as in, it doesn't cost money to go shooting. And we don't require that hunters coming into our country go with New Zealand guides or anything of that kind, which would be possible. Um, we've talked about cost recovery already. So the foreign hunters are another issue where we're not getting cost recovery. Customs importing of weapons, not cost recovery from the dealers or the retailers, and so on. Um, and hunters. Now, hunters play a really important role in New Zealand. They are one of our only two effective means of controlling um, pest animals, and we will not be able to support and protect our populations of native birds without hunters. Um, however, at the moment, sometimes it's unclear whether hunters are protecting or undermining the bush and whether in fact for some hunters their main object is to increase best animal populations and that there's a lot of opposition in that community to the Department of Conservation. This doesn't make for a good relationship with other people using the bush. It doesn't, it increases this kind of hostile rhetoric that I gave you examples of earlier. Okay, so possible changes in the second tranche of legislation that have already been announced to the media by the government include a register for all firearms, five-year licenses rather than 10-year licenses, and that there will be a three to four month select committee process. So there will be on this round of legislation a very thorough discussion of the options. Public health action. How to get involved. We would like to see a departmental submission to the sec select committee on the second round of legislation. We know that sometimes um, we run out of time. We don't think that should happen in this case, but we'd just like to say we think this would be a really positive thing. Um, we'd also encourage people to make individual submissions where they have issues that may not belong in the departmental submission and to share the information about making submissions with other people and other organizations that you're involved in. Um, now, I've been involved in setting up Gun Control New Zealand, and I'm just gonna try and go through to the website, which apparently should be really easy. Um, Can you have a go, Brody? Okay, thank you. Um, so we'd like to encourage um, you all to consider joining Gun Control New Zealand. There are, we have three aims. We want a gun register for all guns. We believe, based on the example of other countries around the world, that this will contribute to effective policing, that it will contribute to tracing guns after burglaries. And the intention is that this should be and a role in system so that the burden on gun users won't be substantial. Um, Sorry, Zoom okay. things in the way. <laughs> um, and we, we would also like to ask you to share the Gun Control New Zealand um, information on your social media pages for those of you. I have recently discovered that we recently, that when you like a page on Facebook, it means that Facebook sends it out to more people than they would otherwise do. So I have to ask if you would like our pages. <laughs> um, yes, so this is our website. Um, yeah, so this is um, Nick Green, who's um, one of the three founding members, was involved in setting up a petition the morning after the massacre, which got 70,000 supporters and which was presented to Parliament. Um, we've got some facts about guns, but most importantly, we have our... We have our mission and we have our key legislative aims. So we want the mandatory gun register, which I mentioned. We want to include a record of all ammunition sales in that. We want them to be tied to the firearm license holder, license owner. We'd like to see a strengthening of the ban on all semi-automatic 
weapons, in other words, a rethinking of some of those exemptions. Now, that may not happen in the second round of legislation, but we see this as a long-term process, and what we're hoping to do is establish a strong voice for those who support gun control in New Zealand. There has been no organisation supporting gun control since the 1990s, when those who were doing that were harassed so severely they gave up. And Philip Alpers went to Sydney, um, where he set up a wonderful website called gunpolicy.org. Um, and the third thing we would like to do is to shorten the registration period for licensed firearm owners to three years. Now, it looks as if the government is saying five years. We're going to accept that. Um, we think what the government is doing is wonderful. It is a real achievement when you look at the history over the last 30 years of attempts at gun control. And on that note, I'd like to end and I'd like to say we'd really welcome questions. Thank you, Hera and Marie. We've got um, maybe seven minutes left, so I'll save that for questions. So as, as usual with uh, our public health seminars, if you could start um, with your question by giving your name and the organisation that you're from. Um, just your name. Or just your name if you're not from an organisation, that's fine. Um, and um, if you could please um, keep your questions concise, that would be great. Okay, any questions? Everything's been everything's been answered. <laughs> just a, um, I'm Hilary Stace. I just wanted a bit more clarification about why lead is so bad. I know a little bit, but can you just just give a bit more detail about lead? Thank you. Um, lead has been around for a very long time. Apparently, if you ingest, I'm I'm not a clinician, so I, this is a layperson's answer. I believe if you ingest lead and above a certain level, you start to have a long-term effect on you. Um, women and children are particularly at risk because children's uh, bodies are still developing and they're likely to suffer neurological damage, including loss of um, intellectual capability. Um, so in other words, it affects their IQ. Um, women of childbearing age need to be careful about lead because it causes the placenta and the developing fetus can be affected. Adults exposed to lead can um, experience um, negative effects on all, all the organs of the body, you know, the kidneys, the cardiovascular system, and the neurological system. Um, there may be very few or no symptoms when you get lead poisoning, and that's um, why you need to do some testing to establish that. But as I understand it, lead, blood lead, blood lead, lead in the blood, has a half-life of 30 days. So if you're shooting in May and you don't get tested to October, it may not show up. It's being stored in your bones and teeth and may be released later again into the bloodstream. But if you test within that 30-day period, you may, you may show it up then and know that you need to stop that exposure. Am I right, clinicians in the room? Thank you. I see you nodding. <laughs> no safe lower, um, upper limit of lead. So we, we, have, we have levels that we say it's safe, but actually the harms occur well below them. Yeah, and that's not just us, that's the World Health Organization. Ross Mason, I know probably you might consider me the enemy. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm chairman of the National Rifle Association of New Zealand. I shoot small bore. I wrote the manual for the small bore rifle. Ah, so congratulations. It was, it was me that put the lead in. Um, well done. Thank you. And uh, uh, it was quite funny. A few years ago, I went uh, on my health. Uh, lead level was elevated. And I had to go to the health department, and they, they presented a piece of paper which I wrote, which I thought was rather humorous. Um, a, a few notes. Uh, public health seems to be a risk assessment, or it should be. Uh, I can't help thinking that the risk to New Zealanders from guns and firearms, etc., is quite low when I consider uh, cars and transport. And it's the life of me. If you want to register people for three years for firearms for three years, why aren't we doing car drivers? 
the same, if not more. There is no training for a driver effectively. You can get to have your parent teach you. To get a firearms license, you have to attend meetings, you have to pass tests, you have to get vetted. If it wasn't for a vetting system that appears to have failed for two people in the last recent years, we would have less than 51 people killed in a massacre. So um, I was, <laughs> and I'm over 60, by the way, or 50, whatever the magic number was. But uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit disappointed in, in the lecture today, I'm afraid. And uh, given there was no, no um, uh, comment about the risk assessment of other public health issues. Thank you. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, no, was there was there no question, question there. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was a statement. <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say when I talked on Tuesday to the tramping club, I was talking to trampers and I tried to, to um, focus it on the issues I thought were relevant to trampers. Today, we are talking to public health and we are talking about firearms. We do have other seminars weekly where we talk about other public health issues. And yes, you're right, a lot of public health is about risk assessment, and then it's trying to work out what can be done to minimize those risks. Now, when we started out two and a half years ago, people really thought the chance of terror, a terrorist attack occurring in New Zealand was so minimal as to not be worth thinking about. My concern is that there are issues that suggest to me that the risks could be rising, like the constantly rising number of guns in, in New Zealand, for example, and the fact that many people have large numbers of guns, um, and the failure of government over decades to respond to the concerns of um, substantial reports, like the Thorpe Report or the bipartisan um, Select Committee Report on Illegal Firearms. Um, I hope that we can build bridges with the firearms community and I think that we need to recognise that we all have a place in our society. I don't see that the limits that are being placed on firearms are very substantial. I think they're quite analogous to the limits that we place on car driving. It may be that I would agree with you that car drivers need more training. Do we have any other questions? Or um, are we able to check whether there are any online? Oh, we've got a Louise? question from Louise up there. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Up against the I'm Louise Delaney. I work here in the Department of Public Health. Um, this is just a relatively practical question. Um, we've often heard that a gun register wouldn't be very effective because experience in at least some other countries has been ineffective and very expensive. Um, and in particular, the question about um, being able to sort of somehow rather get rid of the numbers on, on the gun so you can't actually match the, the particular gun with that recorded on the register. Um, do, do you have any comments on the effectiveness and the feasibility, e.g., compared with the Canadian experience? Well, the example used is usually the Canadian experience. The Canadians started setting up their gun register as a computerised database in the 1990s. We had some disasters with computerised databases in the 1990s in New Zealand. Um, I think, and by the time they got to the point where they, they'd kind of lost the battle to keep that register, the police were finding it useful. And I think the indications from there and from other countries are actually that a modern, properly funded register should not be an undue burden either on police or on the licensed firearms owners. Um, and that it will help in policing. In terms of, um, sorry, what was your other question? Oh, well, look, I, I don't, I, it seems that that is a lot more difficult than it's being suggested as. I have to say, I've been reading the American um, media reports and American um, research from an organization called The Trace, which follows a lot of crime reports. 
And the American FBI and other um, police agencies do a lot of following guns across state lines and a lot of following guns through um, several owners. And I have never seen any mention of the removal of serial numbers as a problem. It, in fact, it has been suggested that it's a lot more difficult than simply scrubbing something off, that, it, that the serial number may still be um, retrievable when that's been done, and that also what is very clear is that while actual use of guns in America is very poorly regulated, the manufacture of guns in America has been very strongly regulated. Every part has some kind of serial number. Every part has a document trace, uh, document trail. And so I, I think that, the, that both of these um, claims, if they were ever true, they are no longer true. It could be the case too, Louise, that if you have a firearm that doesn't have its number on it, it's, a, it's an illegal firearm. So, you know, if you want to be a legal owner of legal firearms, you have to have a, you have to leave them on. We have some online questions. Uh, How yes. many are there? Just this one. This one. Okay. Uh, Cecil asks, what is your view on semi-automatic pistols? Um, pistols have been on a register in New Zealand um, since the 1980s when the... Sorry. Oh, okay. No, I think they, pistols were kept on the register from 1983, okay. I think. Um, and there ha doesn't seem to be crime committed with pistols. The system of, um, in fact, the pistol register really seems like an advertisement for a gun register, actually, because it seems to have worked effectively to have, and the, the pistol shooters, and I think pistols includes um, a range of small arms. Um, is that correct? I'm asking you. Yep. And... Um, they seem to be to be really pretty rigorously self-policing um, set of groups. Um, so we don't feel comfortable with the expansion of gun sports to include the use of full-size semi-automatics, which has been happening in the very recent years. But we don't see that the, um, the small arms have been a problem. Um, take one more question from in the room, and then if we've got time, we'll take the, the final one from online. So, gentlemen up, up near the back there. I'm, <clears throat> I'm David Harding, a parish minister in Newtown. I'm appalled that there are 248,000 licensed firearm owners. It seems to me that one of my responses is to want to reduce that number firearms who, for whatever reason, feel the need, or who have inherited firearms, or whatever. Is there any discussion about incidents of owning guns as a public health issue? One of the things, thank you for your question. One of the things we haven't really talked today about today is the suicide issue. Um, as you may have seen, and I see a member of the advisory group to the National Suicide Thank you, Ruth, <laughs> who's in, in our department, is in the room. Um, yeah, most of, the, most of the firearms deaths in New Zealand are suicides. And you can, um, there isn't enough information, I think, about the types of firearms that are used for suicides at the moment. So I think the government may be working on that. Is that right, Ruth? <laughs> in terms of what's recorded now, yes, so in, in the, the, the generally available um, statistics on, on gun deaths and gun injuries, there's really only two categories of, of firearms that they, that they measure or that they report, um, which tells you very little about the broader range of, of guns being used. So there's, I can't remember whether it's some handgun and and anything else is kind of the extent of it, which, yeah. But in Australia, I think the, the data shows that people are more likely to use their common or garden 22 for a suicide. So um, not necessarily pistols. 
So um, that is a concerning use of firearms. And I think the tragedy of um, firearm suicide uh, is something that can be prevented. The data show that people who have ready access to firearms are more likely to use the firearm for suicide than other methods. So there's a clear link between um, having it there available and knowing how to use it and using it for suicide. So yes, sir, it would be good to see fewer guns in our country. Um, I would like to say, though, that, that there's regular accusations that we want to ban all guns, and that is absolutely not true. From the start of this research, um, we started with discussions about hunting. I'm a tramper myself and talk to hunters when I go tramping. And I value the contribution that hunters make to the bush. I hope that we can resolve the, com the conflicts that are occurring in relation to DOC and 1080 and so on um, and get back to a more relaxed relationship amongst different groups. Um, we don't have any alternative ways of um, limiting our pest populations. Genetic means are not going to save us, uh, just in case you're wondering. Um, so I guess I have to say that the, there's only about 6% of the population who are firearms owners. I think rather than decreasing that number, it would be like, I would agree that I think we would be better off with fewer guns per person. I do not understand what some of the firearms owners need so many guns for. Can I just finish up with the last question from online? Uh, so Clive was asking, you kind of touched on it, um, do you think tighter legislation around guns will contribute to the reduction in suicide? Gosh, if only we knew. But the evidence seems to be that yes. Um, and it's because what Hera said at the beginning, that um, firearms are so immediately lethal, you don't have a chance to think, oh, as you get to take the pills, maybe I'll stop taking the pills. Or as you get the rope out, someone comes in and finds you. So that it's because they're so immediately fatal that um, firearm suicide is so terrifying, really. Well, we'll wind up there. Thank you very much, Marie and Hira. Uh, we've had some great discussion at the end there um, and some good questions from online. Thank you all for attending.